All right. Great. So welcome everyone to, again to EAC's next installment of our online educational series, Our Coastal Climate. This today's talk is going to focus on climate, butterflies, and you. And we're featuring today Matthew Forster and Mary Ellen Hannibal. And my name is Morgan Patton. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental Action Committee of West Marin. EAC was founded in 1971, and this year we turn 50. We're a grassroots environmental nonprofit dedicated to protecting and sustaining the unique lands, water, and biodiversity of coastal Marin County. We developed our online educational series focused on climate to provide some information to the general public about how our climate is changing and those impacts. The climate crisis does present an immediate need for action in addressing hazards associated with climate, changing our actions, and building community and envir environmental resilience is our ultimate goal. And the decisions and actions we take today have lasting impacts for generations to come. This installment of our educational series was inspired by the work of EAC and our partners that we completed at the end of 2020 when we published our report, Marin's Monarch Movement. The report combines the best available science from the Xerces Society and the work of organizations and individuals in Marin County to create a comprehensive guide focused on the County of Marin to help to protect and provide habitat support for the Western Monarch Butterfly. Um, the report is a wonderful handbook for how you can learn to take the right action in the right place right now to help the Western Monarch Butterfly. And I wanna give a special shout out and thank you to Mia Monroe for her inspiration um, and helping us launch this effort and build this report. So we're gonna kick off our program and hand the controls over to our speakers in just a moment. But I'm happy to welcome author and environmental journalist, Mary Ellen Hannibal, who will be our first speaker, followed by insect ecologist, Matthew Forrester from the University of Nevada to our program. And let me stop sharing. And Mary Ellen, you can take the controls. Okay, hi everybody. I'm, I'm really so happy to be here and I'm, grazing my eyes over all of your faces and see some friends. So thank you for showing up, my friends. Um, I really um, appreciate that. You guys know me, you know my story pretty well. So this is a, be a little bit of a repeat from you, perhaps some of some of what I'll go over again. But um, so I want to start from the beginning of the slideshow. Why isn't it giving me the full thing? Hmm. Um, I like to tell my story when I talk about what citizen science is because in a, in a huge way, citizen science is about um, your story. And what, one of the, the, the best things about it is, is the invitation that it gives us to, um, there we go, to really try. And I mean, it's, it's trying because we're grappling here with trying to integrate our personal stories with who we are as individuals with what's going on globally, regionally, nationally and globally. And, and, you know, hearing what science has to tell us about what's going on, but then going through our ordinary daily lives, wanting to intersect in a more powerful and more um, impactful way, and yet not quite knowing what to do about that. And I, I had, I think, just a strange, fortunate stroke when I wrote this book, Evidence of Evolution, which is a book full of photographs also of specimens from the California Academy of Sciences. And although I've been um, a book review editor and a travel editor and basically a liberal arts kind of person, I had written a lot about nature and the environment when I wrote this book, but I had never really thought about evolution. And it turns out that there is a big narrative here, one story that we're all part of, and it is evolution. And then, of course, I learned in this whole um, writing of this book about this extinction crisis that we're in. This is a great auk skeleton on the left and Carolina parakeets on the right. And here's the Xerxes blue butterfly. And this butterfly, you know, butterflies are amazing, right? Um, so I wrote a couple books that I'm going to mention in between, but now I'm writing a book about butterflies. And 
I think partly because this butterfly is so beautiful and I just wonder how did those colors come together like that? And this butterfly has the ignominious distinction of being the first invertebrate to go extinct because of human impacts uh, in the Bay Area, it happened right here in the coastal dunes. So when I realized that all this was going on about extinction and all these beautiful life forms that form the history of all of us, um, which is our story, you know, it's our genealogy, it's our family history. I said, I got to find out why this is happening. So this is the book that I wrote after that, The Spine of the Continent. And it's basically an overview of conservation biology as a discipline and what, how it tells us what is happening with nature, how science and environmentalism have not always gone together, but have been brought together in the last decades. And I profiled some of the animals and their problems along the spine of the continent, including the pronghorn antelope. This is um, an image from the, the evolution book, but it's really uh, one of the, the tenets of the spine of the continent and conservation biology is that really all life forms interact with each other in a way that creates the web of life, creates evolution across time and space. The top predator has a, has a very important role in that and the top predators are go extinct, going extinct at a faster rate than other organisms. And this is an illustration of a wolf with an elk underneath it and a beaver at the very bottom. And then the, the vegetation is aspen. And this is an illustration to demonstrate basically how this trophic cascade or food web connects all kinds of organisms in this web of life. That's what the spine of the continent is about. So I'm doing this, writing this one of the continent and I'm you know, profiling all these wonderful scientists and activists and issues. And, but I'm, I'm counting on one hand, like how much actual conservation outcomes that are positive for biodiversity are actually being achieved. And there's not very many of them, right? And meanwhile, at the same time, the stresses against nature are accelerating. This is an image that a young, um, actually she was a, either a postdoc or a doctoral student in Liz Hadley's lab at Stanford painted a number of years ago to illustrate Tony Barnowski and Liz Hadley's book, Tipping Point for Planet Earth. And um, it, it says it all, right? We're at, we're at this crisis point. And I could show you many slides of devastation and destruction and fear but you probably already know those. So I'm gonna skip over those for now, but suffice it to say they're real and they're actual and we have to pay attention to them. So when I actually made a little list of the projects that I knew about where I could really see measurable outcomes for, for efforts to help biodiversity, they all had something in common, which is that regular people contributed to the data collected for them. And not only did regular people do that, but especially on the Intermountain West, where you, you typically have a much more polarized conflict between pro-environmental people and anti-environmental people, it turns out that people, a lot of people, no matter how they present themselves, actually love nature and actually work on its behalf. And when they work together on a project and don't talk about their politics, they tend to get a lot done. And then they also go together to city halls and to board of supervisors meetings and uh, they advocate for the species that they have helped to, to tell the story of because their story starts to become part of the story of the organism or the ecosystem or the landscape that they advocate for. But then there's a very other important, hugely important thing about citizen science which is that it is data-based. It is based on data. And data is what scientists need um, in order to make their case about what they see is going on out there. So this is just one of uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and has like, I think 15 or 20 of these GIFs out there. You can look at them. This is a single warbler species. One single little warbler and this bar on the bottom is going from January to December and over again. And it's tracking the migration of this bird. This picture, this story is entirely based on citizen science observations of warblers. 
And in the world of citizen science, there is no equal to eBird. eBird and the birders, they have, they are, they're telling us more about biodiversity than has ever been known before and in amounts that are mind boggling and, and they are fantastic. So what do we need from citizen science? Um, we have urgent data needs. We have to actually know how many birds are where, how many butterflies are where, when are they coming out? Uh, when are they migrating in the case of migrating species? And then how are those, um, so how are we seeing the story, the life history stories of all of these different animals and plants together whose life makes up evolution and the story of life? But we need to know very, very, very specifically data points about who, what, when, where, and how. So how are we going to do that? There's not enough scientists in the world, far, far not enough, to give us that kind of data. But we have a lot of people that can give us that data. And this is um, a little illustration of how iNaturalist works. So iNaturalist.org, many of you already use it. Many of you know about it. It's um, an online database for observations of nature and anybody can use it and it's very simple that's many layered I've been teaching environmental science at uh, the California College of the Arts and I have the students using iNaturalist of course and we go over their observations all the time and it's absolutely extraordinary because some of these students with the zoom times now right I've got three students who are in China so just this morning, I was seeing species in China, you know, birds, I've never even imagined birds could look like that. And so all around the world, people are collecting data and observations into this database, iNaturalist. And this little space time, um, little, little diagram on the right, starts to get at why this data is useful for science. Now I'm going to take a little time out from butterflies and citizen science to bring you to another citizen science project that you at this wonderful organization, the Environmental Action Committee, uh, are involved in. And that is Snapshot Cal Coast. You see the little logo on the left. So this is a project that's been going on since 2016 using iNaturalist, where for a bounded period of time, 10 days to two weeks, all kinds of agencies and nonprofits and community groups along the whole coast of California have made a concerted effort to get more and more observations on iNaturalist. This is just a sampling of organizations that are involved in this effort. And you can see your own environmental action committee logo there up on the upper left. And this is just a screenshot of observations that people using iNaturalist in this bounded period of time have collected about the coast. And don't we love little gifts, these little um, motion, these little movies? This is just, iNaturalist is growing and growing and growing. And so are the, the, um, the efforts to, to learn from it. So you can just see from 2010 to 2020, we're just, we're doing great here with getting observations. This slide, you know, I hate slides that have a lot of words on them, so don't read it really except that I want you to see up at the top, california.gov and then California Biodiversity Collaborative. Did you know that we have that? It's really amazing. And there's a huge effort with funding to actually document all of the plants in California going on right now. But come down here to the box where it says early warning and forecasting system for coastal biodiversity. That's what the data is used for. So it's not like we just collect the data, we're actually looking at the data and this is something that Matt is going to be able to tell you how scientists look at the data and what kind of story they see in it. And that story has to do with the past, the present, and the future health of biodiversity. Now, here is an amazing thing. Today, more than 60%. Now, if I had been editing this slide, this is a slide from Geo, whose name I can't pronounce, who's the most amazing data scientist at the California Academy of Sciences. It shouldn't be over 60%, it should be more than 60% of data in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, our community observations, that citizen science collected observations. We are getting more information from citizen scientists than has ever been collected about life on Earth before, 
ever, ever, ever. It's extraordinary. You can see that eBird leads the pack and you can see that we are should all be ashamed of ourselves for not being from the Swedes, the Swedish Swedes, the Netherlands or the Danes. They're all doing amazing amounts of biodiversity observations. But then there is uh, iNaturalist doing really, really pretty great in terms of the numbers of observations that we're collecting through iNaturalist. So this, I'm just showing you this slide so you can make a note in your calendar that this year's Snapshot Cal Coast is June 11th through 30th. And I'm sure you'll be hearing from Morgan and or whatever other groups you are involved in about participating in this. But when you feel despair in the middle of the night, terror in your throat or in your heart um, about what's going on in the world, then say, what well, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna take some pictures on iNaturalist for Cal, Snapshot Cal Coast, I'm gonna help. And one of the reasons I, I did wanna plug this to have you in, get involved in it, but also to come back to the monarch butterfly and to all other butterfly species. And Matt can really tell you that it's not just monarchs that are plummeting in numbers, it's they're all plummeting in numbers. You know, the monarch is our wonderful poster child for climate change. It's, it's an animal that people respond to. And it's, uh, it's you know, it's practically, erased uh, the, the Western migration here on the West Coast, but we don't want it to go. But one question I have, and Matt and I can talk about this, is why don't we have the same kind of coordinated effort to monitor insects in California as we do for plants? The California Native Plant Society does a great job, or for the coast, which many, many professional organizations and nonprofit organizations coordinate with. And when you guys are part of this Western monarch effort, you are actually part of something that is building toward that kind of network. So I also highly you know, advocate, you may not, I mean, it's an important network to establish because it will be a network that we can use to monitor not just monarchs, but also other butterflies and other invertebrates. And, you know, You've got your Western Marin Environmental Action Committee. In Marin, you also have One TAM, which has a stupendously and wonderfully vibrant community citizen science um, projects and an organization and focus. We have down the peninsula, we have the, the Santa Cruz Mountain Stewardship Network, which has networked, you know, like 80 different organizations. What we're trying to do here is actually create a network of nodes so that we can collect information and create a picture that's not just local, but it is regional and then continental really. I mean, California is a very big state. This is Jane Kim painting that monarch. <laughs> she is a slip of a thing and she creates a gigantic impact uh, because she is super passionate about animals that move. She has something called the migrating mural and she's just responsible this really she's a tiny person with a gigantic soul and a gigantic talent and she's a um, inspiring she's so inspiring she's a very gifted artist who could have any kind of career she wants and she really chooses to paint murals of animals where they go through so that we can see them when we're not seeing them. This is a map of the um, spring and summer monarch migration. We've got our two populations of the east, eastern uh, monarchs and the western, and this is the fall and winter. And the reason we know they do this is because of citizen science collected observations. One of the things that is great about butterflies is that it has been a field open to amateurs for hundreds of years. I've been obsessed with, um, I'm writing a book now about butterflies and Vladimir Nabokov has something to do with it, a lot to do with it. And the reason for that is that he was an amateur lepidopterist who contributed real science to the field. But he also allows me as a writer to tell a story that more directly relates to one person, his life history, 
going through the Bolshevik Revolution, going through world wars. You know, he was born in 1899 and he died in the 70s. And this is a life through which you could tell the history of the world in the last century. And it's also a life through which you could tell the history of what's happened to butterflies and how we know how butterflies operate and what they are. And one of the main things goes back to evolution, which is evolution is the big narrative. It's the big story that even our biggest storytellers like Nabokov or Shakespeare are but data points in, in this big magnificent panoply of life. Um, making that grand statement, citizen science also brings it back to you individually. It's your story. It's your story when you start using a naturalist or eBird or any or engaging in any other kind of way. You start to tell a narrative of your own interaction with the natural world, what you do for it and what it does for you. And one thing that all of that conservation biology tells us is that life works through relationships. So we need to relate to nature, relate to nature through citizen science because you can personally enjoy it, but you can also give really usable data to a scientist like Matt Forrester, to whom I will now turn over the Zoom frame. Thank you. Great, thanks, Mary Ellen. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, and it is a pleasure to be able to uh, talk to all of you today. Um, I really do feel that it's um, that it's time for greater connections between professional scientists and everyone else, partly because the world is at a tipping point uh, and we can't any longer, I mean, we probably never should have relied on professionals or politicians to solve problems. And that's for sure true now more than ever before. Um, it's also the case and really what motivates me to talk to as many people as I can is, as Mary Ellen was saying, the data that citizen scientists, I also call them community scientists sometimes, you folks, if you use iNaturalist, the data that you create, it's not just nice or in addition to what we've done, it's actually ushering in a new age of big data for ecology. You may have heard the phrase big data, it's kind of been used for, for example, the medical sciences, now that medical medical researchers have access to genomes, for example. They have big data. Ecologists now have big data. It's just massive piles of information that we can use to learn things that um, weren't con were, didn't seem possible even a generation or so ago. So that animal right there, that's the Melissa blue butterfly, which makes a nice connection. I actually just added it as Mary Ellen was talking because I realized it connects to Vladimir Nabokov. Um, this is a group of butterflies, uh, the blues, in particular Lysiades is the genus that he was quite obsessed with. Um, and he was really remarkable in that he, he wasn't necessarily good at numbers. Um, but he just had an artist's eye for morphology. And he looked in particular at the genitalia of these animals, which is something we do with insects to differentiate species. And he, he could see differences among very closely related species. And even more remarkable, he identified areas where different species in this group were hybridizing. Um, and we've since gone back decades later with molecular tools and verified that he was right more often than he was wrong. Really remarkable, like standing on top of a mountaintop in, in Colorado and saying, you know, the butterflies right here in this group, these blue butterflies, these seem like they're intermediate. I'll bet they're a hybrid between this species and this species. Um, and then he's right. And it takes us hundreds of thousands of molecular markers to see that. In any event, the point of starting with that anecdote is I've been um, a faculty member here at the University of Nevada, Reno since 2008. And for about the first six years of my professional clear career, um, I focused on that butterfly uh, and Nabokov's blues. They're really wonderful, basic questions about how evolution works, how the world works, uh, but things have changed. Uh, and I've tried to change my research to keep up um, with the world and the world is changing so fast that we need to look beyond individual species and their beautiful stories of evolution and figure out how all butterflies are being affected by the changes of the Anthropocene or the current period 
of, of um, Earth's history in which we live. So I'm gonna tell you a few things about what we've learned actually very recently um, in terms of climate change in particular and butterflies. And you might wonder why I focus on climate change and not things like development and pesticides. And, and I'll tell you why. Uh, but let me uh, first give you just a sort of a lightning tour of the last uh, three and a half years of scientists and the public worrying about insects. Um, so it was in fall of 2017 that researchers from Germany reported sort of unthinkably large declines in the biomass of insects flying around that country. So they had had these passive insect traps across the countryside, many locations for decades, um, these passive traps that just collect flying insects. And they had been in storage for a very long period of time. They processed them, they asked, had the biomass changed and it had, de it had decreased by up to 82 percent. Um, and it wasn't surprising in the sense that declines were happening. We knew that insects were declining. I had published on it, many, many other people before that. What these folks did that really sort of turned the world on its head was partly reporting such large magnitude declines, but also um, they did this really simple thing of just tallying up biomass rather than talking about diversity changing or even abundance, um, which in some ways are far more accurate or they, they're more meaningful to me, they're more meaningful to evolution in a way to talk about diversity, but somehow talking about the just biomass of insects really caught everybody's attention. In any event, that set both scientists and uh, the press and the general public on a trajectory for a couple of years of thinking pretty big thoughts about what's happening with insects. This was a, a widely read piece from the New York Times in 2018. Very serious possibilities being discussed about disappearance or massive reductions in insects having consequences for ecosystems and in turn for human society. Over the course of the next year or so, 2018 into 2019, lots of other studies turned up, um, looking at historical records, revisiting historical sites and finding that there are fewer insects than there used to be. Um, that goes on and then we get into farther into 2019, let's say, um, and even into 2020. And people are asking the practical question, okay, this seems to be a thing, what do we do about it? Um, which is great. We're still, asking, we're still asking that question and trying to answer it. Uh, interestingly, we get farther into 2020 and we get a little bit of skepticism. And this is often the way it goes in science and science interacting with popular press and the general public. There's a big idea and then there's excitement and then there's a little bit of back and forth. Here's some of the back and forth happened earlier in 2020, specifically because a couple of studies from North America came out saying that Maybe it wasn't quite as bad as it looked. Maybe it wasn't as, as, as widespread as it seemed. Um, that would be great if true. Um, even headlines as sort of dramatic as the insect apocalypse has been canceled. Um, that leads me to ask what's happening in our backyard because it is a fact that in those three and a half years of studies coming out on insects and insect declines, very few studies were being reported from the Western US. Uh, we live in a, a unique region, as you all know, um, for various, for many reasons. One is that we have great, great extents of open land, protected land, relatively undeveloped land, also arid lands, which makes our region different than some other parts where we have historical record parts of the world like Western Europe. Um, we also have um, we have concentrations of humans that are very discreet um, and you can find sort of relatively clear boundaries between where people live and open areas. Lots of, lots of reasons to think that the West might, might or might not be different from other parts of the world. I had previously worked with butterflies from the West, specifically from a narrow sort of transect across Northern California um, that I'll tell you about. But this has been the question, are, de are declines widespread among Western butterflies? Why butterflies? Um, I, I sort of have the feeling I might not have to justify that to this crowd. I mean, butterflies are just wonderful. How can we not love butterflies? But we also study them um, as representatives of insects in general. Um, they are the group for which we have the most data. Uh, so we, we study them out of convenience, but we also believe that they tend to tell us something about other insects. And I could talk more about that if people are interested. Uh, so these are the three data sets that I've been working to bring together. So the Shapiro data set from Northern California, 
the North American Butterfly Association data set, uh, also known as NABA, uh, and then iNaturalist records, which Mary Ellen mentioned. Most of the last 12 years, even 20 years, I've worked with this data set. So Art Shapiro's my former advisor from UC Davis. Um, he's a, sort of a big presence in the naturalist community for Northern California. Some of you may know him or have seen him give talks. Those are his 10 sites from above and then in elevational profile here with the colors corresponding to elevation. So he has been visiting these sites, these 10 sites every two weeks during the butterfly flight season, which is spring into fall since those dates pictured there, uh, which is approaching 50 years for some of those sites, which as far as I know has no precedent in the history of science uh, to have one person taking regular observations at a set number of sites for 50 years. Um, it's certainly North America's longest running study of its kind. In my lab, we have taken over the monitoring of the mountain sites, which is awfully convenient because I'm in Reno, so we have easy access to these. And then art continues at the low elevation sites. We had known for some time um, that butterflies were declining across those 10 sites. That little graph there is not terribly easy to read. It's just a histogram counting up the number of species, which is what the y-axis is, that are in some kind of decline, more or less severe, there's variation, but about 80% of species are being seen with less frequency than they were 20 years ago. Um, so I've known that for a while. I've also known that those declines were more severe in the Central Valley, less severe in the mountains. Although fascinating, and this sets up the story that I'm telling you today, is that that picture of more severe down here and less severe in the mountains changed after the mega drought years, which you, you'll probably all remember living in the West from 2011 to 2015, when we were hit by that millennium or thousand year scale um, drought. Uh, at that time, we saw declines in the mountains um, sort of be realized for the first time. I think they had been ongoing, but they really became evident. That raised the possibility that climate change could be impacting butterflies that were relatively removed from development. That's what I set out to answer by bringing in these other data sets. Uh, they're distinct. I'm actually going to say most about the NABA one, although the iNaturalist records are fascinating too. NABA organizes what is essentially the butterfly counterpart of the Christmas bird counts. They organize folks to go out uh, for at least one day in the middle of summer to a set area and come back to that same area every year and count all the butterflies and identify them within a certain area. The color coding is there by elevation, which kind of shows you the great diversity of habitats sampled here. So it's both next to urban areas and far out in the wildlands across both of those other data sets, we unfortunately saw a signal that was very similar to arts data, that is a majority of butterflies in some kind of downward trajectory seen with less frequency than they were 20 years ago. Um, let me give you two examples of that. So here's the West Coast lady. If anybody that has ever been out in any kind of, hardly even needs to be a natural area to see this animal, at least it didn't need to be 20 or 30 years ago. This is a widespread species. You see a map there, which comes from iNaturalist, which is this great data that lets us figure out where things live. Um, but it's a big animal, it's dispersive, it flies far. Um, it also eats a few different hosts that are definitely not rare. In fact, it eats um, Malva, I always called it cheeseweed when I was a kid in the Central Valley. It's one of the more persistent sort of urban and suburban weeds that gets in the cracks of your sidewalk. People tend to hate it, but it's a great butterfly host plant for this butterfly and others. Uh, so this butterfly doesn't have a problem with finding host plants, but yet, oh my, it's really hard to find these days. These downward trajectories you see here are from the Shapiro data, Northern California, NABA across the whole West, and then decreasing frequency with which it has been reported from iNaturalist records. So that's a big animal, dispersive, eats a bunch of different hosts. Hosts are not, not rare. Here's another animal with very different biology. So this is a little California hair streak. I really am fond of the small butterflies in this family. So this is the Lycenidae, same family as that blue butterfly that I used to focus on exclusively. In any event, this is what we call a colonial butterfly, which means you can see a lot of it in one spot, 
And then you might look a long time until you find another spot of it, but wherever it is, it tends to be fairly abundant. And those individual spots might look slightly differently, sli might look slightly different because evolution is going on different trajectories in these different spots. It's um, more specialized in its, ho in its host preferences. Um, so very different biology, but also in very severe decline, which you see those trajectories there. Um, here, zooming out, you see our list of top 50. And sorry, this is a very busy graph here. But what's on this graph are dark dots, with, which are estimates of population growth rates for 50 butterflies across the West. And basically anything to the left of the dotted line is in some kind of a downward trajectory. The underlying gray dots are population level estimates across all species. So not just these 50, but 262 for which we had enough data from these sites. We estimate about a 1.6% decline per year in the number of individual butterfly species. So that's from our paper that was just recently out. I guess it was a week and a half ago. I think there'll be a link in the chat if there, there isn't already. 1.6 is fairly shocking. A top, two things to note about it. Um, first, it's remarkably consistent with other rates of decline that have been estimated for other insect groups uh, in other parts of the world, which is almost eerie to me uh, to see that kind of agreement. Um, very different parts of the world, very different habitats. But what does 1.6% decline mean? This is math that we all learn in high school in terms of compounded loss or compounded gain. If your bank account was learn losing 1.6% per year, you'd be very sad. Um, here's one way to think about how it plays out. Imagine a meadow or a field or a riparian area that you went to 20 years ago because you know it's a nice place to see butterflies. I just assume everybody's a butterfly enthusiast one way or another. So someplace you would go 20 years ago, nice mountain meadow, let's say you saw a thousand individual butterflies. Wouldn't be that hard to do on a nice day in the middle of July in the Sierra Nevada, regardless of the number of species, let's say there's 40 species. So a thousand individual butterflies, if we take a 1.6% reduction and compound that across 20 years, our analyses suggest in that same meadow, you might see somewhere in the 720, 725 individual butterflies. So more than a quarter of the, of the original sort of number of butterflies, fewer seen today, fairly shocking. Um, but like I said, consistent with other estimates from different parts of the planet. Here's where the monarch far out falls in our list of top 50, as I think Mary Ellen alluded to. Um, it is declining, of course, quite severely. It's not the worst we've got. The monarch is, is, is unique in the, in the sense that it's one very large population in the West, um, which makes it different than these other species that tend to, at least almost all of them, have subpopulations. That's a different issue. Suffice it to say, we have lots of very severely declining butterflies, of which the monarch is one. Um, what next? What would we want to know? The first thing we wanted to ask is if we could understand the, if there's any sort of elements of the biology of these organisms that identifies them or would predict them as being more severely declining, which is kind of a classic conservation biology question to ask. I think it may actually be a downright old fashioned question to ask these days, because the fact is that these declines are sufficiently ubiquitous or widespread that they're just affecting butterflies in general. We did find some evidence that species with many gen generations per year um, and species that started out being more abundant are in slightly less severe decline, um, but those effects are really pretty weak. Um, so what else would we wanna ask? More interesting, it turns out to ask um, where on the landscape do we see the most severe decline? So rather than asking which species are in more severe decline, looking at these locations in the map there, um, where are you seeing fewer butterflies and where are you not seeing fewer butterflies? So for that, we did a solid year and a half of statistical work. It's basically what I did for most of the pandemic. I do get in the field too, but we canceled a lot of lab work. So I spent a lot of time uh, looking at this computer, working on models for these declines. And for here, we're just trying to predict the total number of butterflies as a function of climate and climate change, not the same thing, and the fraction of land that is urbanized and the fraction of land devoted to agriculture. Out of that analysis, we came away with a fairly strong signal of climate change affecting these butterflies. This graph um, is a little bit complicated, but I'll just show you, and this is the last, um, well, actually it's not the last, second to last graph I'll show you. Uh, on the x-axis here is the difference between fall and summer warming at individual locations across that map. 
Locations down here in the lower right are areas where fall is warming more rapidly than summer. And we actually found that fall warming was the most significant predictor of declining butterflies. What about you should be saying to yourself, agriculture and urban development? We already know that those things are really important for butterflies. From the Shapiro data from low elevations in Northern California, we know that the timing of pesticide applications and land that has been converted to urbanization is a very serious impact on butterflies. For this study, we were more focused on the open undeveloped spaces. Um, and it is the case that for this NABA data where butterfly enthusiasts go out to look for butterflies, they tend to pick really nice places that are removed from ag and urban development. So in this current result, I'm not saying those things aren't important. I'm saying we had the right data to look for a signal of climate change and it was surprisingly strong. So the y-axis here is rate of change in the total number of butterflies being observed. So for example, I mentioned um, the, the rate I mentioned before is hovering sort of around there, but there are far worse ones. And they tend to be places where fall is warming faster than summer. And this is news to me, although it's not news to climatologists, fall is warming more rapidly than any other season, which I show you here from publicly available climate data that we tabulated. So here's minimum temperatures, maximum temperatures, precipitation over a 30 year span, but on an annual basis. So those rates of change there, if anybody pays attention to the details of climate change, you typically hear things like, um, you know, two, two tenths of a percent over the course of 10 years. Uh, that makes sense here because this is per, an per annum. So you multiply that by 10 and you would get those numbers. That's uh, details. The point is, is that if you look at the relative magnitude across the seasons, you see fall is the highest. Fall is warming faster than summer. For an already arid climate, we expect that this is really important for the butterflies, which is what our analyses suggest for at least a couple of reasons. And let me tell you what these are, and then I'm going to be winding up here. One, it's possible that that is a key part of the year for stressing plants. Um, in an arid uh, landscape, uh, where most of our precipitation falls in the cooler months. By the time you get to the end of summer into fall, those plants are kind of, you know, waiting in quotes for the first rain to come. But in the meantime, the, the nectar is dwindling, host plant quality is dwindling. So if you take that ecosystem and you stress it with warmer and drier conditions, it could be that the resources for the butterflies are just collapsing enough that, for example, females don't find enough nectar to be fueled enough to lay enough eggs to seed the next generation. Also, even more intriguing, I think, butterflies in the temperate zone need to go into a resting period, of course, to survive winter. We call this overwintering or just being dormant for winter. They do that based on cues that involve temperature. And so if it doesn't get cold enough, it may be interfering with their decisions on when to go into dormancy. It also could be that they are trying to go to sleep and I'm, sleep is in quotes here, this is a dormant phase, but that it's not quite cold enough to, to send them deeply enough into that state. And so they're sort of burning up fat reserves rather than fully saving them for spring. We are exploring these hypotheses moving forward. I don't have the answers to that uh, yet. Um, there's also a lot that yet to be learned about the geography of where these temperature effects are being realized, which I think you might be interested to know, and I know a lot of folks are interested in the monarch, so seasonal warming along the coast is really important, and I don't have the answers there. That's something we're exploring next, and I'm not a climatologist, but I'm working with some folks to understand sort of exactly which kinds of habitats and parts of the West are warming more or less. From my sort of first take of the geographic pattern, it seemed that more southern areas had more of that issue of fall warming faster than other seasons, but it was really complicated and varied by elevation and by proximity to the coast. So that's something that we're really working on. Um, and with that, I would like to say thanks for listening so far. Uh, those are some lovely pictures from Jeffrey Glassberg, who is the president of the North American Butterfly Association, who was a co-author on our recent paper, and he gave me those to use. And there is my um, email address. If folks have questions or concerns or, or whatever that don't get answered today, I'm happy to correspond with folks, but I'm going to stop sharing now so that we can discuss. Great, thanks so much, Matt. That was um, actually really enlightening. I was taking a bunch of notes um, through both yours and Mary Ellen's talk. Um, we're gonna open this up to questions. So I'm hoping folks won't be shy. Um, what you can do is either 
raise your hand and we can just call on you and unmute you and you can ask your question or your other option is you can type something into the chat and we will be monitoring that and Jessica will uh, read those questions out that get answered or asked into chat. So let's see. I we'll have one question. Um, we just got one uh, from Dennis Latka. What is the name of the muralist Mary Ellen mentioned? So that's for you, Mary Ellen. It's Jane Kim. And you can find her online if you Google Jane Kim Monarch or Jane Kim Migrating Mural. And then um, one other thing, it's, I just realized I skipped Mary Ellen and Matt, we're gonna talk for a moment and I jumped over that part. <laughs> so well, if you want to go straight into questions, we can, we can um, I mean, I have my questions for Matt. Too. I think, yeah, let's start off with your questions for Matt. Let's jump into that. I think that will be great. And then we can, um, as they are talking, um, if you have questions, why don't you enter those into the chat and then um, we can ask those in a few minutes. So a couple of things, Matt. I mean, that was a wonderful, amazing presentation. Thank you so much uh, for doing that and for all the work that you have done and the attention that you have been paying um, to butterflies. So just getting this information, um, I guess just as a human being, <laughs> as a person, I'm like, oh no, if it's climate change, what are we gonna do about it? Because that feels like we can't stop that locomotive. And so it is like, are some of these butterflies gonna be able to adapt? Are some of, we're gonna lose some of them? Obviously we should try to safeguard habitat for the ones that might have a better chance. Um, what, what do you think? Yep, so there's many interesting things there to think about. One, and I think maybe maybe I'm reading between the lines a little bit, but I think there's often a feeling like, could it really be the case that a couple of degrees matters for butterflies across a wide region? Um, that seems to be yes. Um, and I think the important thing to note there is that nature goes through all kinds of changes, right? There have been periods in the past with more or less insects, things go up and down a lot. What we're discovering is that the warming we're now experiencing is having a negative consequence on insects. Um, so, so, so what do we take from that in terms of what do we do, right? What's worth doing human society? We hope that our study adds motivation to fighting climate change, which of course involves voting and all kinds of other things that need to be done. But here's the thing that I think is more interesting. Um, there's sort of a, maybe it's, maybe it's not ironic, but it's maybe counterintuitive. We've discovered that butterflies out there in the in the protected spaces and the open spaces that aren't protected in the West, of which we have a lot, are, um, are not just, just cooking along fine. They're actually cooking, they're heating too much, and they're declining. I think that means that the lands that we have closer to hand become more important. I think it raises the stakes for good management of agricultural edges, of backyards, and of city parks. Um, those places can be valuable butterfly habitat. Now, the fact, if you can improve your city park and get them to stop using less pesticides and plant more natives, that doesn't mean it's gonna save all of the rare butterflies that are in the Sierra Nevada, but it does mean there are butterflies that will use it and other insects. So I think the stakes are higher for making good decisions about those lands we can affect. I have to tell you, one of the uh, main, so by the way, a big plug for this incredible Monarch report that Morgan and Mia made and that you can download um, and read. So one of the main takeaways is yes, plant milkweed for butterflies if you live within a certain distance of the coast. Do not use tropical milkweed because tropical milkweed doesn't die back with a frost and it, uh, the butterflies don't leave and then they become more susceptible to a parasite that the milkweed can carry. So I was just, she would really kill me if, if she knew I was gonna do this, but I'm gonna do this anyway. My Aunt Marie, who lives in Florida, very proudly sent me a picture of a monarch in her backyard. She said, look, it's on milkweed, tropical milkweed. <laughs> and I said, dear Aunt Marie. <laughs> Now, I don't know if tropical milkweed is as bad in Florida as it is here in California. Maybe it isn't. But um, it brings up the question, though, Matt, that, that um, we have to be kind of 
careful and calibrated about how we actually adapt urban biodiversity for wild species because some of the data and, and Morgan can, and Mia could speak to this better than I can, but there were high, higher butterfly counts in some parts of the Bay Area this year where there is very little native milkweed. And the thought is that this is, uh, we're seeing higher numbers because it's uh, the, the butterflies are feeding on tropical milkweed in people's backyards. So essentially then we, we start to almost be changing the life history of the Western monarch. I mean, maybe that's absolutely inevitable anyway, but um, it's just as a story, I think that highlights like we can't, it's not just any old habitat, right? Yep. So there's two issues there. There's sort of how do you make choices for your yard in general for butterflies? And then what's going on with the monarch? Um, so setting aside the monarch for just a minute, uh, in terms of choices to make about your yard, I, I like to think about sort of a gradation of effort because not everybody has the time or even the resources to figure out the native plants that'll grow in their yard. Um, and to change their landscaping. That's great if you can do it. Whatever natives you can plant, there are insects that will use one, butter, use them in butterflies and other insects. But even if you don't have the, the leisure to do that, there are small things that you can do in your yard that make a big difference. Spray less pesticides and herbicides. That has a beneficial um, effect on insects. Also, consider letting your yards be a little bit messier. Um, this is now well known that having leaves sort of linger longer in your yard, um, gives space for insects that spend the winter at the soil leaf interface. So that's good for biodiversity. It's also the case that some of the weeds that we are sort of used to pulling out of our yard can be used by local insects. A lot of insects and butterflies like the monarch are now adapting to exotic hosts. Um, you know, they are using them as important resources. Do they come with some complicated consequences? Maybe, sometimes, and the monarch might be an example of that, but we know lots of cases where they are the best resource that they have locally, especially in urban and suburban areas. So letting your, letting your yard be a little bit messier, fewer chemicals in your yard, those are important. Now, the case of the monarch, I'm not an expert on monarch biology. There are a lot of people these days that are. Um, the tropical milkweed is complicated to me. To me, it's not as simple as just saying, if we had zero tropical milkweed, it would all be fine. Tropical milkweed was around in California in urban areas before we started seeing this sort of shift in the migration pattern. So it's possible that the warmer conditions, especially in the fall or winter, are, are in interfering with their decision to go into diapause. Now, it's possible that the milkweed, the tropical milkweeds are exacerbating that effect. We don't really know. Native milkweeds are better for sure. Um, does that mean that you need to go out and rip out all of your tropical milkweeds right now? Um, you could do it, especially if you have the, the time to replace them with native milkweeds, uh, that's fine. But we don't really know all of the sort of pieces of that puzzle in terms of um, causation and the tropical milkweed. And I might get some hate mail for that too. You might. Yeah. I want to ask for my Aunt Marie. No, she's going to she'll send you a love letter for that. Um, I have one more question to ask you. I think that there's questions out there. Um, oh, I see Dan Glusenkamp. Hi, Dan. <laughs> um, about um, iNaturalist. So I, I have to tell you that I first met Scott Laurie, who is the co um, principal of iNaturalist, because like in 2010 or something, or 11, he wrote a paper called The Velocity of Climate Change. And what his paper did was model what species were gonna persist, how, how climate change is gonna affect different species depending on where they live. And it, it showed that alpine species were gonna do better than, and that seems to be what you're seeing with your butterflies. But I mean, part of what was motivating him to be involved with with iNaturalist, which, you know, he joined up with Kenichi Ueda, who had invented iNaturalist, part of Scott's burning, you know, um, motivation was to actually say, how are species um, actually adapting to climate change? So it would seem like your paper is kind of like a, pro a case, in, a proof case for, for Scott and iNaturalist. But how does a scientist use iNaturalist? How do you make these observations that are, you know, contributing to science into 
what we think of as real science that you do. Yeah, I'm glad you asked because I, I, I think it's, it's not appreciated how valuable these historical observations, and when I say historical, I mean any observation that was made from yesterday previously, right? Records that are associated with a particular place and time, we can use them to study climate change effects and the effects of development. Um, we all are taught, I think, in high school or maybe earlier that science is about doing experiments. Um, and then, so if, you, if you're out with an iNaturalist app, and are you doing science because you're not doing experiment? The fact is that huge areas of science have nothing to do with experiments. There are plenty of areas of science like climatology, like astronomy, for which experiments simply aren't practical. And that is the case with much of ecology these days, because we're trying to understand phenomena that are playing out across huge spatial and temporal scales. So we build statistical models that we believe tell us things about how the world is, works. Um, we also all are raised with the idea of correlation does not imply causation. That is true if you pick random pairs of variables, like you know the number of cell phones and, and the number of grizzly bears, and you can sometimes find a correlation, but that is not what scientists do. We take suites of variables and we do the math that we believe reveals causation among those variables. It's the reason we know that smoking causes cancer and cancer doesn't cause smoking. It's epidemiological, it's historical work, it's much of science. Anyways, that was maybe a bit of a soapbox, but I, I like people to know that historical records from citizen scientists are as much science as somebody doing an experiment with a Petri dish. Was there another question in, in what you asked, Mary Ellen? I forgot. I don't think so. Thank you, that's great. Um, there are some great questions accumulating in the, in the chat, I think. Yeah, you've been touching a little bit on them and uh, those were all great questions that kind of lead into what these folks were talking about. One of the things uh, Susan Holloway had said was, uh, could you expand Matt on the relative problem posed between climate change versus pesticide use. She just attended a webinar from the UC Botanical Garden where the speaker identified pesticides as the primary danger to butterflies locally. Would you agree with that? Um, yes, so it all depends on where you are. Um, and, and I'm glad that that question was asked because it's been a worry of mine that from our recent work about the open spaces of the West that the conclusion might be drawn that, well, it's all climate change, so pesticides don't matter. Um, that's not the case. In general, we know that habitat destruction and then contamination, mainly pesticides and climate change, those are the big three. And the relative importance depends on where you are. So if you're in an an urban area or next to agriculture, it could be that pesticide drift or pesticide runoff in waterways is indeed the most important factor. Uh, what we've discovered is that when you get away from those things, climate change is also having a large impact, larger than we inspected, expected. Now, sort of the exact balance of those, it depends again on where you are and which species you're talking about. We know those three things are important and we know that in ag and urban areas, pesticide is, is hugely important. Thanks, Matt. Would water also be a factor? Someone asked, as you were saying, it's getting warmer in fall. Is uh, the drought affecting insects as well? Yeah, in fact, the, the mega drought years, as I mentioned, 2011 and 2015, that was really what opened our eyes to the possibility of climate change affecting insects in the West. Even in mountain ranges, where we previously had had this expectation that Mary Ellen alluded to, that animals on mountains should be able to sort of move up and down slope and adjust their habitat and find a cooler north facing slope, et cetera, to live. That's been an ecological expectation for at least a generation now. Um, but when we have climate change across a wide area that includes extreme events like mega droughts, there's nowhere to hide. Um, so climate change is now having a more pervasive ex um, impact than expected. And yes, water availability in the, in the West in particular seems like it may be the key thing. So when I talk about warming fall temperatures, it's really warming fall temperatures combined with drying conditions. Those two things make drought. And as everybody knows these days, we seem to be entering a world where we're gonna alternate more between mega storms and mega drought, which is just a whole other ecosystem for animals to adapt to. They will give them, give them 100,000, 500,000 million years. Sure, the earth can bounce back from all kinds of things, but the immediate forecast is not great. 
Great, thanks. So I guess this comes back to the age old question of how people can help, right? Uh, so a, lot, a few people had questions about this ever growing issue between tropical milkweed and native milkweed. And so some of the questions we had here were, um, if our local area is experiencing warmer falls, would it help to plant more plants to nourish butterflies later in the year? Or would that discourage them from flying to the coast when they should? Um, and then there'll be a follow up to another plant question. Yeah, so in terms of the milkweeds, native milkweeds are still the best we can do. Like I mentioned, I think there's some complicated biology that we don't understand about warming temperatures versus tropical milkweeds and the decision to fly to the coast in diapause. But in terms of precautionary principle, native milkweeds are great. Let's go with that. Uh, other decisions for plants to put in your yard for um, butterflies and other insects. A diversity of native plants is the best you can do. With a diversity of native plants, you'll have broader flowering times, etc. cetera. Um, but as I mentioned, and I think for everyone here, they probably wouldn't have a problem looking up native plants. But sometimes I talk to groups where um, they may not have sort of the, the spare income or whatnot to, to get native plants. So even just deciding not to put poisons in your yard, that does a lot. Um, and I, I often have people come up to me after a talk like this and say, but I really hate aphids on my roses. Can I spray for them? And I say, no, <laughs> the time has passed. Do what? not buy poison for your roses, I'm sorry. I have a question for Morgan and Jessica. I mean, I, I don't keep you know, uh, fastidious tabs on everything that you're doing, but it seems like we have this disconnect, like in Marin, I can drive to a Lowe's and buy enough Roundup to basically kill a small country's worth of biodiversity. And, and it would seem like, you know, it's like, I can't understand that. And then the other thing is I can walk into a nursery and buy French broom. So what, is there an effort in Marin to get, you know, people from our community that you represent to, you know, have community meetings with people that work at these places, with people that are customers there? Is there an outreach to like not, you know, attack them because they don't know and, and just come to some peaceable understanding of the choices that people have. Um, are there alter, you know, alternatives like a class on how to get rid of the aphids on your roses without poisoning the neighborhood? That's a really good question. Um, in the Marin's Monarch Movement report, this is one of the reasons why we highlighted um, specific nurseries in the Bay Area around their availability of native plants and whether or not they have pesticides in stock. Um, one of the inspirations of the report or an outcome of the report is we now have a monthly meeting with um, organizations and individuals. Um, it's coordinated, I think Ed Newt is on this call, um, for Ed Newt from the Marin Audubon Society um, and Mia and I and others um, participate in this, but we have, we're using our report and that action area um, for exactly that. Where, how can we dial in on pesticides and how can we activate people in their local communities to have conversations with their local nursery about what native plants are available? Um, I think, I, don't quote me, but I think Scotch broom is, should not be sold in the county anymore. <laughs> if it is, we would wanna look at it, but I'm hoping that that has been finally removed. Um, but talking about pesticides, talking about availability of natives and also labeling whether or not the plants have been treated with any type of um, pesticides is also important because that's not always on there. So you may purchase something, bring it home and in that, um, accidentally bring poisons into your garden. Um, but also this kind of ties in with um, the concerns we have with fire. So having specific non-natives that may um, create different fuel intensity is something else. We would want to get those off of the shelves of some of our nurseries so that we are having our native plants there. Um, so in yeah. progress. What, what, that's all amazing. And I see um, Dan from California Institute of Biodiversity um, talking about legislation, leg legislation that's being introduced, which is all really amazing. One thing that I'll add that an individual person can do when you're in a nursery, even if you're in your local native plant nursery, it doesn't hurt to ask the person working there, do you know if this plant has been grown with or without pesticides? 
Um, because just because you're in a nice local nursery doesn't mean you're not buying a plant that's already stocked with neonics, which is this um, class of pesticides people probably know that goes systemic into plants. And the person working there uh, eight out of 10 times won't know, but they'll sometimes go back and ask their manager, which can then start a conversation and they can put a sign up, et cetera. So it's a good way to start that investigation. Speaking of fire, Matt, I can't imagine that these mega fires that we were having in our sort of new fire season of all year round is, um, is helping the butterflies too much. It's hard for us to breathe and when, that, when we're in fire season. I can't imagine that it's easy for a butterfly to breathe. Where do they go? I think for the most part, they, they die when really large areas burn. Small areas of burn is fine. And that's, as we all know, part of the natural landscape and creates some renewed vegetation that they can take advantage of. But these really large, really large mega fires that are happening will almost certainly result in extirpated butterflies or local populations that are just gone and might take decades to get back. One of uh, the long-term Shapiro sites in the coast range, Gates Canyon, completely burned this last year. So that's gonna be really kind of fascinating to see it um, come back or how slow it takes to come back, how long it takes to come back. And this is really basic, but are there butterflies that like bury their, um, is, there, is there some butterfly species that might have found some kind of strategy to where there, there's some kind of protection against the fire? Not that I know of, you know, they spend all kinds of way, they spend their dormant phase in all kinds of different ways, sometimes tucked down in the leaf litter, um, some can even be up in trees in certain ways. So it's not impossible that some of that is resilient, but I don't, I don't think so. Certainly not from the really hot fires. No. To the point of your um, wonderful suggestion about leaving you know, your yard messy. I live in a, I have a, just a deck, which is just beset with spider webs all the time. So uh, cobwebs, and I, I usually leave them because I'm lazy. <laughs> but sometimes I brush them away. But I've also had like this like hysterical um, conglomeration of hummingbirds this year and noticed a hummingbird taking the spider webs to make its nest with. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, um, this is nature making itself out of nature. So we can't get rid of it, right? I mean, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, that's a good example of what seems to us like a mess nature will find a way to use. Oh, that's fascinating. I did put another link into uh, chat, you guys, if you haven't downloaded the report, there's a lot of this good information in there about the background of at least the monarch and um, then also like the nurseries that we've been working with and different plants, nectar plants that you can plant. People had some specific kind of questions about how to do planting and when stuff, but I feel like you've actually hit a lot of the things by <laughs> Mary Ellen asking questions. Like it just kind of naturally answered some of the questions here in chat. Was there anything more specific anybody wanted to ask? Want to raise a hand? Want to put it in chat? I feel like we didn't cover or catch. You know, another uh, really concrete thing that people can do locally that's maybe a little bit larger than our yards is you can call up your local city parks department and ask, can you tell me which pesticides are being sprayed in which parks? Um, I've done that here and it was kind of eye opening in that it was not the same across all parks and some parks had been sort of slated to be cleaner and prettier than others, which means more poisons. Um, so it was really eye opening and it, it didn't necessarily lead to anywhere, but it, it could be a start depending on where you are to saying, well, hey, um, you know, do we need to have that in all parks? Maybe we can have other parks that are messier and better for wildlife. Yeah, and as members, a lot, of, so a lot of the people that are here today are members of the Environmental Action Committee of West Marin. You know, we're here to protect and sustain the unique lands, waters, and biodiversity of this coastal area. And we do that through advocacy, which takes a lot of time. Some of our things don't happen right overnight. So by you guys being here, you supporting this event, you supporting the Monarch work that we are doing, or any of our other programming um, that can make a big difference right there, just in your local community. So I encourage you, if you're not members, to go online at eacmarin.org and sign up. Um, and that's one way that you can help. And occasionally from time to time, we will have some petitions and things you can sign and put that out there. But it looked like Dan, if you guys look, in um, from the California Institute of Biodiversity is also on here and he had some 
good actionable items that they might be doing on pesticides and things as well. So I would encourage you to check that out as well. Looks like also Suzanne Clark has raised her hand. Suzanne, if you want to unmute, um, if you yes, ask your question. Thank you. I wanted to ask Matt um, what he thinks happened to the monarchs as they've been migrating from um, Canada when we've had the fires and the smoke in September, October, um, where do you think they went to? Well, it's a great question. And the last few years have had such, such shockingly low numbers of monarchs that it just becomes really hard to keep track of exactly where they're going. So I don't know. Um, and there are folks working on that issue in terms of trying to track the monarchs. But I was just wondering if they could have possibly, um, you know, because one one year they uh, they moved over. Um, I I wondered if they move over to the east on the eastern side of the continental divide, or maybe over in Nevada or something, and then went on down to Mexico because that was the year they were 144 percent more in Mexico, and we were down, you know, hugely. And I just wondered. Is there any chance that they could have done something like that? You know, there, there's always a chance. And we do know that there's some movement back and forth, um, particularly sort of through Arizona. We know that some mixing happens, um, but not very much. Um, so I, I don't think there's any, there's any reason to think that that explains the great decline in the Western monarch that we're currently experiencing in the last few years. It's not that they've just gone somewhere else. But that's not to say that there isn't some occasional mixing between those migrations, as far as I know. You know, another interesting thing to note about the monarch and how complicated it is, is it's such a widespread species that it samples all of these problems. And by that, I mean, it's exposed to pesticides and land use change and tropical milkweeds and climate change in the mountains and climate change in the desert. That makes it really hard to figure out, which is true of other species in our top 50 list of declining species. For example, that West Coast lady or even the painted lady, which also migrates from down south up north and back, um, also in decline, very hard to figure out for those species exactly what's going on. We're trying. Um, thank you. I wanted to add um, and give Mia Monroe a chance to talk. She's a longtime EAC um, supporter, a former board member, and has been working with Morgan on the Monarch Report. And she also does the butterfly accounts now for I don't even know how long, 30 years or something. So she could talk a little bit about that's a direct action in a way that you could get involved too. Mia, did you want to unmute yourself and say something? Jess, and this talk has been so fascinating and insightful with some specifics that we each can do. I just wanted to take a moment and acknowledge specifically some of the community scientists that are listening in here because they are the backbone along with the Xerxes Society of doing this longstanding community science effort that has gone out during the Thanksgiving count and later the New Year's count period to document the overwintering situation. Um, and they follow protocols. And this year they had to follow safety guidelines to be able to uh, continue the monitoring. And um, this is a longstanding effort and it started was started by the Monarch Program 30 years ago and is now overseen by the Xerxes Society that trains and audits and manages the data so that it can be used by scientists, be reported in media and forms the basis for what we're talking about is the monarch crises. But I would like to acknowledge that I see Rebecca and um, Suzanne and others such as Juan, Audrey, Eileen and Steve who are all out there collecting data um, regularly and according to the protocol uh, twice during the Thanksgiving count and then again during the New Year's count to document the population. So I just want to say a hooray and shout out to you. They've also risen to the occasion to look for other things such as when do we first observe monarchs moving in to the coastal area, what happens after storms, we're out looking for early emerging milkweed. So um, 
I just, it's, there's a real good core of people and there's many others I see on this call, but those community science volunteers, thank you. Thank you, Mia. Did anyone else have a question? Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Morgan. Susan Holloway has a question. Oh, I don't see it. It's me. Wave your hand. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm not looking at the screen. I'm looking at the little chat thing for a hand. I'm like, I don't see one. I know, it's an old fashioned way of asking a question. Uh, as long as we have a, a minute or two, I just, um, I'm really interested in the topic of citizen science and I've been doing some reading about it. And I, I wonder, um, Mary Ellen, if you have anything to say about the relationship between the kind of data collection efforts that you guys have been talking about today versus uh, what some people call participatory action research where the people are, the, the citizens or the community members are involved not only in data collection, but in um, even forming what questions are asked or how the data is analyzed or, or utilized. And I'm trying to sort of see in terms of how this growing field is structured, how much overlap there is in methodology and, and how much is seen as kind of a very, it's a different approach. It's a, such a good question, Susan. Thank you. Thank you for being so interested in it. Um, so for the other people who may not have heard of this term, uh, public participation in scientific research, PPSR, is well, sometimes um, a few years ago, there was a movement to sort of not have citizen science be the kind of name of what we're doing here, but it, for it to be PPSR. You know, this is a problem when you can't name anything PPSR, it's just really deadly. Um, <laughs> but it does get at something, which is that especially initially, it can seem that what's being asked of participants, regular people, is to just contribute data to somebody else like Matt, who's gonna do something with it. But that's, it's really, that's the entry level. Um, and there's, the whole thing is just an explosive, big, occurring on multiple scales movement made possible by Linux technology, by you know, by technology essentially, and then also by our our global crisis here. So you know, we all know about the Flint, Michigan water um, issue crisis. That's a citizen science story. Those women got together and they said, "This is poisoning." you're poisoning our water. And the, and the city officials said, no, no, they're not, no, we're not. And you know, these women went out and they got themselves a PhD scientist who came and helped them devise a protocol for, for measuring their water and the, and the lead in it. And that's what you need to have. So they are the ones that came up with the question. And they are the ones who then got help from a scientist to get a protocol that would hold up in court. And essentially, you know, you want your data to hold up in court because natural resources are finite and we've been fighting over them as long as we've been homo sapiens and we're not gonna stop fighting over them. And this is actually really where, you know, environmental justice and social justice intersect with this hugely. There is a citizen science listserv. Um, I can, if you email me, I'll, I'll send you a link to it because what's fun about it is you just, it's not overwhelming and you don't ever have to read it if you don't feel like it. But you just get a sense of this is a global movement. It intersects with citizen mapping and a whole geospatial geographic movement to have people define territories differently than, than just by sovereign nations and boundaries. You know, what we're what we are we are all sitting here in a gigantic transitional moment in history. It's and it's the agony and the ecstasy and the best of times and the worst of times. In the, on the citizen science listserv, you'll see some key players that are having their eyes on all of the above. And um, I read them, I'm interested in it. I decided myself that I care about biodiversity the most and that also I wanna do physical things for nature. So I wanna go out and pull you know, invasive species. I wanna take pictures of um, snowy clovers so that I can help those birds. I wanna get, personal about how I'm helping, but there's so many other ways to do it. Um, and then 
it's very interesting. Some of you might be interested in this. Um, you can you can Google this term anti-colonial lab, and you can find a little video by this scientist Max Liberon, and she is running an, a feminist lab in Canada, and she. It's, it's fascinating what she's doing. She's working with her local community to, to measure microplastics in their fishing, uh, their fish. And then when she gets her data, she doesn't just publish it. She actually goes to the community and says, do you want me to publish this or not? And it's, it's a can of worms, right? <laughs> because you know, you're going to buy that fish and they know how much microplastics are in it. So that community is making a decision about their science and what it's going to be used for. But this is very problematic in a global economy, right? So, you know, it's not like this is a solving thing. This is a new tool for grappling with, you know, as Matt has been, I think, fascinatingly describing a huge shift in science to like, what, what is science? How do we do it? What experiments are not adequate? to grapple with what's going on. It, we need this bigger way of doing it. Um, mm -hmm. so, so the way that we look at the community that we belong to, what, what our um, obligations are, what our rights are, what our, our, um, our agency is. And the thing is we have these tools of agency and we have to use them. So I gave you a very broad. No, no thank you. That, that's really helpful. I, I would say that, you know, I, what also concerns me, it, as you say, it's a can of worms type situation, but for people who are already have a lot of challenges and maybe fewer resources in marginalized communities, I can see the importance of having them have a voice in, in uh, identifying and solving the problems, but, do, but to ask them to also use their resources of time and effort to uh, participate in a research project seems problematic to me. I, I, I worry a little bit if we're relying exclusively on people who are already so pressed to be coming up with these. And so I, I kind of, it's like what you were saying, Matt, that not all, all of us have time to go out and rip up all our yard and put in all native plants. We don't have time, we don't have resources. So I'm trying to think through kind of what can we ask of community members in terms of this deeper engagement in research without being unrealistic about their resources. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I mean, these are some things, to be honest, I hadn't thought that much about. I mean, I've thought about using citizen science data, but in terms of getting feedback from communities to guide research questions, um, it's pretty interesting. I mean, as, as an academic, I like to think that I do research that people are interested in, but that connection is often rather tenuous. That's interesting. I like the idea. I put some stuff in the chat here about ways that you can get involved, but to your point, like even kids in different generations, like people love using their phones. It's a technology, technological tool. And, you know, a lot of us love to take pictures, do it all the time. Just now do it in iNaturalist and there's a little way that you can contribute to science. So that's an easy way that people are already interacting with something that they could get involved without having to redo their garden or, or whatnot. So there's also these other mapping things or going out and doing the counts and stuff that you can do just to get outside. We also have a, another monarch, uh, talk coming up at our Point Reyes Birding and Nature Festival, which is going to be virtual this year, um, April 22nd through 25th. Um, and that'll be another chance to learn more about uh, monarchs as well. Um, and you can always go online and download the monarch report to find out about plants and things like that if you do have the time and money to go that route. But I do think that we're probably having to wrap it up. So I'm gonna turn it over to Morgan um, and she can close us out here. Great, thanks, Jess. Um, and just thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Thank you, Matt, for fantastic presentations and sharing your time with us today. I think we all learned quite a lot. This is a really wonderful talk, really engaging, and um, it's given me a lot to think about as we're moving forward and 
addressing the biggest challenge of our time, which is the climate crisis and all of the areas that it's actually overlapping and impacting. Um, again, thank you everyone for coming. If we, if you put a question in the chat, we're copying that. We're gonna look at that, make sure we've answered the questions. We are recording the video. We will um, post this uh, probably in about a week or so once we get it formatted, get it on our website and share it with everybody. And if you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out to us over at EAC and we can share that information with Matt and Mary Ellen. I think they both did put their contact info in, the, in their slides as well. But thank you, you guys. Have a wonderful day. Hope you can get outside and enjoy the beautiful weather. Thanks for having us and thanks yeah, for all the Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Same. Great, okay. have a great afternoon. Thanks. Bye everybody.